Hello, John Perry here. This is my, well, first ever podcasty interview type video uploaded to my channel. It's fairly long, over an hour long, but it's one that you can listen to without having to watch. So while you're cooking or driving or going for a jog or whatever. And my guest is a very interesting man, Aaron Ra. He is the director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project. This is a website which he hopes will be available to the public sometime in the fall of 2018. And it acts as a giant searchable evolutionary tree. On launch, the tree will have over 50,000 organisms in it, which you can explore by clicking around. And that number is just going to increase as time goes on. They're going to be constantly adding more organisms to their tree. And this is going to be an absolutely incredible tool. Really useful for anyone interested in phylogeny, interested in exploring relationships of different plants and animals and so on. I am extremely excited for this to come out. In our conversation, we focus mostly on phylogeny and cladistics and the history of taxonomy. Taxonomy is humankind's ongoing attempt to classify and categorize all living things into a single comprehensive system. One of the most bizarre things that we talk about is this strange case of a single-celled organism that evolved from a Tasmanian devil. It's now a cancerous parasite that Tasmanian devils pass to one another, but it originally evolved from a Tasmanian devil. So by the normal rules of phylogeny, it should be classified as a single-celled mammal because it evolved from a mammal. That's kind of amusing shows some of the difficulties in trying to come up with a single system to classify all life on Earth. So, without further ado, here it is, my casual conversation with Aaron Ra. Aaron is the director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, and we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to talk about just kind of the basics, kind of an introduction to phylogeny and how phylogeny is different from the older ways that we used to classify plants and animals and living things. So, Aaron, could you let's start by, I guess, a quick overview of how things were in the past. So, before Darwin, uh, Linnaeus to Owen. Okay, well, that 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 that's a good way to put that. Uh, there's a reason that Darwin uh, had had already had evidence to go on. You know, many people would say that in Darwin's time that there were no transitional species to be found. And uh, he predicted, actually, that there would be. And he gave a number of those predictions. And, and the two of the most dramatic ones were, uh, were revealed. One uh, in 1974, that's the missing link that he predicted there should be. And that was discovered in 1974. And also in, during his own lifetime, immediately after his book came out, he suggested that, that there would be a bird found with unfused wing fingers. This would be you know, confirming his hypothesis that birds had descended from from dinosaurs, or you know, a dinosaur cousin reptile. And uh, you know, as I said, that that was vindicated just a couple of years later. But with there not being anything recognized as a transitional species within his time, though there have been hundreds and hundreds found since, how did Darwin know to make these predictions? What was the evidence that he had? And the evidence that he had was actually the taxonomic tree of life that was phylogeny. Uh, because 100 years earlier, in pre-Darwinian times, a creationist scientist named Carolus Linnaeus, uh, originally a botanist, uh, was classifying different types of plants and just decided to classify all life. And he discovered that there were, they were in a, a nested tree pattern, that, uh, that, that, it, that you would have different organisms within a parent organism, where you'd have two different sets of organisms within two parent organisms and those uh, those parent categories belonged to a larger parent category that encompassed them all and so on it went lots of different groups within groups within all these other groups until there was a branching tree pattern and he had no way of explaining that in linnaeus time it was considered that uh, species were immutable speciation had not yet been observed and so the creationist prediction, and you know that you know the way a good hypothesis is supposed to work, you make predictions and see if they're vindicated or falsified. And the creationist said that you know that evolution would be proven when there's a new species seen evolved. But of course, we've now seen new species evolved directly under direct observation, both in the lab and in naturally con naturally uh, controlled conditions in the field, so many times that even creationists don't deny this anymore. But of course, they don't accept that that's evolution, like they used to predict that it would be. They said they would change their minds if this ever happened. Of course, 
then it happened and they never changed their minds. Yeah, well, let's talk about uh, what it was exactly that Linnaeus is doing a little bit. So, so he, I guess in the past, people had been classifying animals more kind of on what they did. Uh, but Linnaeus wanted, he was trying to classify things on their similarities and differences. So he was, he was putting things into groups. And that's a, that's a good point we can, we can bring up too, because uh, I've, I've known people who did that, uh, that classification by what they do. You know, mm -hmm. when the Bible does describe whales as though they are fish. Right. Because the whale makes no distinction because if it swims, it's a fish. And that goes not just for vertebrates, you know, that, that also includes shellfish. You know, you know they, 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 what is it? the Bible describes shellfish as fish that don't have fins or some such thing. You know, have shells instead, something like that. And the Bible does describe things by what they do. For example, in one area, bats are considered uh, locusts. They're the four-legged locusts that the Bible talks about because yeah. they swarm. You know, people say, well, yeah. you know, how can, how can locusts be considered, you know, four-legged? The Bible's wrong about that. Well, it's not that they're, they're not talking about grasshoppers. They're talking about bats. And then elsewhere, of course, as everybody knows, bats are described as fowl, meaning birds, because if it flies, then it's a bird. So the, the Bible classified things by what they do. Like, I mean, look at one of the categories is called creeping things. So right. if it creeps, then it's a, it's in the category of creeping things. And there's there's a couple of named um, classifications or categories that the Bible puts down. It's like they have the beast kind and they have the bird kind. When, when you get something like a velociraptor and it's fully feathered, well, is it a beast or is it a bird? And then right. the Bible gets a little bit more ambiguous, even with the bird kind, because it says there are all sorts of birds and then every kind of bird. So there's there's kinds of kinds. So or, or is it or is it sorts of kinds? Because you know, the Bible has no idea. They have no they didn't know anything about classification. So Linnaeus came along and started classifying things by their morphology, by their physical characteristics. I would like to point out it's probably. I mean, people in the Bible were doing, uh, they were just trying to classify things by whatever they, they saw as being important, right? And you know, people are classifying animals for different reasons. They might be classify, classifying them based on what they taste like, right? Certain cultures might be doing that, whether or not they're edible. Um, but Linnaeus was really focused on morphology, and that that's the big, I mean, that's, that is the precursor to Darwin being able to figure all this stuff out, is because Linnaeus went ahead and already did... <laughs> most of his job for him, right? Very and much, uh, yes. and uh, that's a really interesting aspect of history, you know, like why was why was Linnaeus so interested in this? I'm glad he was cuz it it and really it, you revealed have you have to appreciate how much this overturned Linnaeus world. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, he had no there was no concept of evolution. I mean, so far as I know, he wasn't even aware of Lamarckian evolution yet. I th I think Lamarck came after Linnaeus. And Linnaeus laid the groundwork for, you know, what was happening here, but he didn't know what was happening. So he challenged the scientific community to explain it. And specifically, he challenged the scientific community to explain why we are apes. Because as right. classifying life forms, he realized that, you know, either we are apes or they are humans. And, and he went both ways with this because he wasn't sure. So he classified chimpanzees and orangutans both as a subset of humans. What the scientific community did with that was, you know, of course, he, he said he would fall under the ban of all ecclesiastics if he were to call, you know, an ape a human or human an ape. And he was correct. And so the, the scientific community at that time, being wholly religious, created an arbitrary category called Pongo, which they put in all of the known apes other than people, all of, all of them except us, which right. was a kind of Freudian admission. They knew that that wasn't correct. And so it wasn't until about 30 years ago when we, we, we complete the human genome project and uh, there was a, we got enough of the genetic work done to realize that we actually are apes We're, and that the, the whole uh, arbitrary construct of Pongo was invalid. So they've restructured it. So now Pongo uh, consists only of orangutans and uh, uh, fossil relatives like Sivipithecus, Gigantopithecus, Ramapithecus, and so on. And um, then we have the hominine which is the chimpanzees, the gorillas, uh, 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 bonobos, and humans. And then a handful of other things that would be discovered in the fossil record later. Because it turns out there was a whole bunch of fossil species that we no longer have. And that's one of the things that I like about the project that we're working on. We're, fo we're focusing as much as possible to make sure we get at all the fossil species in that are known. Because there are way more fossil species than there are current ones.
I, I want to talk about your project in a minute, but let's let's nail this down real quick here. The kind of the differences between phylogeny and what Linnaeus was doing. So Linnaeus is he's the guy that kind of invented this binomial name system. So we are Homo sapiens. Actually, we're Homo sapiens sapiens, but uh, <laughs> we he came up with that name. He came up with the idea of species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. I just had to look at those because I, I don't have them memorized. But so he he came up with this, this uh, like you were saying, this nested hierarchies. And he wasn't really looking. He didn't understand. He didn't. He wasn't thinking evolutionarily. So he he wasn't thinking of these things as a- actually being relatives. You know, we have this system of family, but he that was an analogy in his mind, right? He didn't actually think that these different species were literally related. That didn't really come until Darwin's time. But, you know, so so we have Linnaeus coming up with this, and a lot of people started getting on board. You have uh, uh, Linnaeus wasn't really doing much with fossils, was he? No, there was there was almost no fossils known in his time. As a matter of fact, right. it wasn't even known what fossils were. The first few fossils had been discovered, but they, their, their significance wasn't realized. As a matter of fact, there were, there were some people that were saying at the time that fossils were the creations of God, and not to test our faith, but literally just to fuck with us. And so at the point when they first discovered these, they didn't realize that they were living casts or casts of living things or once living things. So they, they literally thought that these were just the artistic things that God has made or that prior cultures perhaps had made. Interesting. So, so Cuvier was, he's a French guy and he was doing, I'm saying his name wrong because he's French, Cuvier. <laughs> but he, he was a big fossil guy. He did not accept evolution either. Ideas of evolution were were being tossed about during his day, but he wasn't really all that interested in them. But what he did notice is that there were certain eras. There were creations b- before the modern creation, is, is is how he saw it. So there was there was different worlds if you dig down deeper in the fossil record. Yeah. Then, then we have Richard Owen, and he he was grouping things again the same way that Linnaeus was. And he had this idea of archetypes. So he saw all these nested hierarchies that, that Linnaeus had found, and he saw those as archetypes. So God had somehow had some kind of a, a basic plan for mammals, and he would tweak it slightly and build different things. And so he came up with this name, dinosaur, which meant terrible lizard, when he found, well, when the first dinosaurs were brought to him. I don't, I don't believe he actually dug them up himself, but he's the one who came up with that name and yeah, first classified Owen, them. Owen uh, famously took credit for other people's discoveries. Yeah, he, he was a very controversial figure. He was very well respected in his day, but eventually uh, his practices caught up to him so that like at the end of a very illustrious career, he started getting a lot of bad press. And yeah. one of the odd things that he had was it was his his idea of God as a tinkerer, that God could learn from his mistakes, so that God would be able to make these prior creations like dinosaurs, but they wouldn't be as good as the things he made after that. Because why would God make dinosaurs to be bigger and better, and not just bigger, but you know they're more advanced. I mean, they're with better respiration, more energetic. Why why would why would God make animals like this and then? make mammals not as good so he didn't he couldn't see it that way he had to see mammals as being improvements over dinosaurs and the dinosaurs were just uh cold-blooded sluggish creatures like like the reptiles we have now you know like 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 lizards or crocodiles or something like that he had to envision it that way because he imagined that that god would create these things learn from the his prior creation and improve upon his own work with the, mm-hmm. the next edition or the next series. And so he thought that rather than uh, one species changing into another, he thought that you would end up with a line of animals that would wear out and and, and become smaller and slower and everything. And so God would, would have to come up with a new series. So I have a lot of sympathy for Owen Oak. So he, uh, he is the guy that, that said, let's build an amazing natural history museum and let's make this if, if you've been to the Natural History Museum in London, it's the thing that everybody else copies. It's the Smithsonian is like a cheap knockoff of what Richard Owen built. And he, full cred. That yeah. building is amazing. Yeah, he it's wanted to. The, it's not just the exhibits in it. It's the building itself is yeah. is a marvel. It, all of Have you been? Yeah, yeah. Just, just the stonework inside 
you know, where they, where they like that, well, they'll hide small sculptures of monkeys or birds or whatever yeah. into the, into the stones themselves. It's, it's really magnificent, both inside and outside. It's an incredible edifice. Yeah. And, and that was his baby. I mean, he, he wanted to, he was doing this for, for spiritual reasons. He wanted to worship God with a museum to his, to God's creation and actually naturalism, which is, it's the, it's the tradition that Darwin was brought up in. That was a, that was really a thing that was started by a lot of clergy that had free time because they only work one day a week, uh, essentially, would start going out and documenting rock formations and animals. And there's there's a there's a strong link between religion and the early days of naturalism. And that's why if you go back and read stuff, especially before Darwin's time, all the naturalist literature talks about God a lot in it, which is really weird for us today because obviously scientific literature doesn't usually mention God anymore where science is now a multicultural practice. So we, we keep different uh, religious and cultural ideas out of it, but good for people to realize too. I mean, like uh, American creationists have no idea that, you know, virtually everyone who, uh, who, de who determined the age of the earth, who determined yeah. the geologic column, who, who, uh, who evaluate all these fossils and their significance and, and, the, the geostratigraphy, all of this, these were all believers. These were all Bible believing Christians. Right. They just, they didn't buy into the current dogma, which is a new thing where you're supposed to deny all of the scientific evidence. Instead, they, they, they figured that, you know, why would God create something to contradict his word? I mean, it wasn't like they worship a book and they deny reality. They, they weren't denying either one. Whereas, right. Modern Christians, I'm sorry to say, I've met several who will state outright that the Bible is the only source of truth in our world and let everything else be a lie. And that seems to be the modern philosophy. But th those sorts of people did not exist in the early days of these scientific pioneers. Yeah, that, that's kind of an American invention. I, actually, it might, it might just be an American invention because if you go to England and you talk to people in the Church of England, people like pastors and stuff, there's, there still is a strong naturalist tradition going on in the Church of England. There still are preachers that will go out and spend most of their time studying rock formations and that they're still doing this and they're still writing papers. It's really the, yeah, the Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen White. She was a prophetess for the Seventh-day Adventist and she had all these visions of the flood and that kind of kick-started the modern young earth creationist movement here in the United States, which has now been shipped back over to England. So now they're, they're dealing with that there too. But the thing that they were facing is as Linnaeus had discovered that there actually is a tree of life. Now this is, this is something right. that creationists want to deny. They want to say that there's no geologic column, even though Christians of the day verified there's a geologic column, we can prove it exists and we can't explain it. And then on top of that, Linnaeus, also a creationist, you know, a Christian, uh, also determined that there's this tree of life. And it, it, it's a real thing. They can all verify. They can prove that it exists. But, and, and by that, I mean that this, this analogous, you know, this grouping that appears when you draw it out on paper, it looks like a tree. So it's a, right. this branching tree pattern to the organization of life. That is actually real. And so there are creationists, Christian, Bible-believing Christians who are saying that these things are verifiably true, and we can't explain it. And so Darwin then uh, discovered that species could be, whole new species could be evolved. And he discovered these with these finches, what he thought were different species of birds. And uh, he brought all these birds back home and then an ornithologist studying them says, no, they're all finches. And they're all evidently related to each other. They are, these are different species of finches. These do not interbreed. They're distinctly different species, and they all come from a common ancestor. And this is, of course, what evolution is. But to realize that new species could evolve this way explained everything. It explained ge geostratigraphy, and it explained the tree of life. Both of them unified at the same time. So when Darwin had this new revelation, he turns to uh, Carolus Linnaeus' Systema Naturae, and suddenly it all made sense. This was the explanation that they had been looking for for 100 years. Yeah, yeah. And that brings us to phylogeny. So back in the day, Owen and Linnaeus, they were just grouping things with a sort of idea of an archetype. And now we have Darwin who comes along and realizes, whoa, these things are actually related to each other. That's why it looks exactly like they're related to each other. So tell us 
how things have shifted in taxonomy. Taxonomy just being the the uh, art of classifying things, I suppose. Yeah. There are some people who say that the word taxonomy should not be used anymore. I don't have a problem with using the word taxonomy, uh, but we're changing from a Linnaean construct to a cladistic construct. And the difference is that Linnaeus had no way to uh, to account for evolution because it wasn't a thing in his time. Right. Uh, however, the, the modern system is it has to account for evolution. It is, in fact, you know, to a large degree based on it. So what you have is uh, you, you originally try to classify beings by their by their physical uh, physical traits and such, and, but you don't always have an explanation for these. Like, for example, uh, I, I, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times before that um, <clears throat> anteaters, aardvarks, and uh, and pangolins. All three had lost their teeth, and so it was decided that these must have you know all had a common ancestor that lost their teeth, and then these three lines diverged from that. But then we got their genome back and it and realized that you know, we're all where usually you get the genetic confirmation that all of these classifications are correct. There are occasionally corrections as well. And this is one of them where it turned out that that uh, the anteaters are in their own little group, you know, Xenarthra, that they mm -hmm. should stay there. But then the pangolins were more closely related to uh, creodonts and carnivores, and that aardvarks are actually more related to elephants. So what had happened was that their different ancestors lost their teeth at different, you know, different times, different occasions, different lineages, and then all ended up eating ants because there's nothing else they could eat now that they were toothless, that kind of thing. Or maybe they had started eating ants and no longer needed their teeth, so they were able to continue to survive without that, whichever way that goes. But so right. it, phylogeny then is different than the Linnaean taxonomy because it has the, the morphological characteristics going one way and then it's twin nested because then it, you can then go for corrections or confirmations using the genome as a ways of checking yourself. So now we have a way and it, it just works exactly like on the Moray Povis shore. We you know when they do the thing about, you know, doing the genetic test to see who your father is. We can actually do that now. It's not analogous. It is actually the exact same principle so that when you you can take your DNA and you can compare that to the genetic records that we have for people all over the world, because there's unique mutations that occur in all these different people all over the place. And we can map those those unique mutations or those unique ERVs or what have you. There's a whole bunch of different genetic distinctions that show how humans have migrated across the planet. And so we can ver verify your ancestry using these genes. So it's not just within your family. It's not just to determine you know which, which guy is your father. We can go much further than that. And of course, we can go much further than that. They've used the genome to map that all dogs, for example, we've got hundreds of different, uh, different breeds recognized by the American Kennel Club. But all of these are derived from four different genetic lineages that come out of Asiatic wolves. So mm. all the domestic dog breeds we have were we're down to four different times that people had collected wolves and began breeding domestic dogs from these wolves and, of course, eventually interbreeding them. Right. I, yeah, I'd heard about the uh, the idea that wolves domesticated themselves so they could eat our garbage. <laughs> so just and, yeah, yeah. and sort of domesticated us or created this, this right. uh, what is it, a liaison or, or an alliance yeah. with us. Yeah, it's, it's really neat to imagine being kind of the first humans that are like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take this wolf that sometimes eats our kids and, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hang out with it. So let's talk about the phylogeny explorer project, which is, I don't know, you didn't start it, right? You, you picked it up. Uh, no, this was something that I've been wanting to do, uh, mm -hmm. for like always. Uh, it, okay. it was, it's, uh, when I was a kid, I was never a creationist. Um, my family was Mormon and they had this, this they, actually observed the tradition of not trying to teach their religion to their children until they turn eight years old, which mm. they considered okay. arbitrarily to be the age of reason. But by that time, a science teacher in second grade had given me a science book with it that had a cladogram about dinosaurs in it. So and it shows how mm. all of these different things were related. And of course, that just made sense to me. And so that was just before you know, my mom finally walks in on my eighth birthday and says, okay, well, here's the Bible. Here's the absolute truth. And my immediate reaction is, no, it isn't, because look what it says here. You know, so that the, so I'd already been immunized against believing in the mythology. But I'd always been fascinated with the classification of life. I always thought it was, it, it's, there's value in knowing where you are in things. I don't understand how people can 
and I know lots of people like this, cannot tell you what states or countries border where they live. Yeah, I just look. They don't. They don't understand where they are on a map. Well, if if you were going to continue walking to the north, what would you eventually see? What's the next state or country north or west of you? I know people who don't know that. Likewise. People who don't know where they are in history, who don't know where that, you know, like, you know, did, did, were televisions invented before or after automobiles, things like that. If, if you can't answer these questions, you don't have a perspective on where you are chronologically. Likewise, I want to know where I am in the tree of life. And it's, it's bewildering to me that other people can, can look at this, but it's so, so simple to put together. It's like you know, the Sesame Street game. You know, one of these things is not like the other, right? right. So you see a cat and a dog and a cow, right? One of them is different, right? We'll say a cat and a dog and a chicken and a cow. Well, now suddenly the chicken is the odd one out, but they know that the cow doesn't really belong with the cat and the dog, right? It's, it's that easy to put this together in many occasions. And so what I'm doing with the, the Phylogeny Explorer project is there was a prior uh, attempt to do this. We want to create a, uh, a navigable online encyclopedia of the entire taxonomic tree of life so that people, I mean, and I want it to use, be used as a tool for scientists. I have some scientists reviewing what we've uh, made so far, uh, and I'll be talking to them in the next couple of weeks about uh, how to improve it to make it a tool that they will use how to, so that it has value for them. And then once we do that, then it'll be have value uh, you know, for teachers and students. But people will be able to navigate through and see how everything is interconnected. Now, there was a, pro a valued attempt to do this was called the, uh, the Arizona Tree of Life Project, which was mm -hmm. completed like in 2000. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was 2000. But that was, that's when they, they lost their funding. And that was essentially what had happened was they'd hired a bunch of PhDs to build a web page which of course was cost prohibitive. There was no need that, that, that all these people didn't have to have doctoral degrees just to create a web page. Right. But you, you can create the web page and then have it be peer reviewed and then you don't have to pay for all of that construct. And that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. We're, we're going through the peer reviewed material. We're, uh, we're accessing uh, the established works, you know, fossilworks.org, for example, or is it .com. Fossil works, nonetheless, you know, has, you know, is a chronicle of all these uh, different fossil finds, and they've already got it classified. And then we we look up wherever there are discrepancies or things that are not listed there. We uh, we go to peer reviewed research materials and find where exactly things are supposed to be, according to the, the latest studies. And then we put in the citations uh, that the in, the in the more info box, ideally. And we're going to be turning this over to the scientific community to fill in all of that. You know, the, all the the more info and the citations and such. And we're just building the tool and fleshing it out. And we've been working on this for more than three years now. We've got a couple of different database engineers create the, the, the database, the spine of it. The first attempt collapsed. It looked nice, but it collapsed as soon as we started putting heavy data into it. The second one is able to withstand all the data. And it has to be correctable, too, because at some point we can come in and say, no, this, this needs to, to be changed over here. We need to be able to move this node and all of its daughters simultaneously over here. We have to be able to do that. And so there has to be corrections that we can make. And so that's been built in. And we've started filling in the, uh, the species. And so far, we're right around 50,000 species. Wow. <laughs> we're somewhere 40, so 40 to 50,000 species have been entered into the system so far. And that's through volunteers that's adding through, that's, that in. Yeah, and right. not many volunteers either, but over, you know, over three years' time. And so... We've already fleshed out our database much more so than, uh, the, than the original Arizona Tree of Life project had done because mm -hmm. they didn't have anywhere near yeah. this many species and they, and they didn't have, they didn't have the, um, as many fossil species either. There were whole huge taxonomic uh, groupings that weren't even included because they were all extinct or what have you or they weren't relevant to what they were talking about then. The, the purpose or the goal of this is not the species themselves, because there's a lot of cladograms that will show you, you know, a, a beautiful depictions of wide uh, variants of species. We're talking about the importance of the different clades. And my video series, The Systematic Classification of Life, explains, you know, what does it mean to be a mammal? What does it mean to be a monotreme? What does it mean to be a, 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 a nephrozoan or a deuterostome? All these different clade names, they have significance. There's a reason that we belong there. Yeah, so so tell everybody what a clade is. I mean, most of my audience should know that, but s some people won't. Your audience probably does know that, yes. <laughs> but a, uh, a, a clade is a taxonomic grouping 
that includes all of its descendants. So like it, uh, when the creationists are always arguing for one kind, you know, giving birth to a completely different kind, that would violate the laws of evolution and the clades are one of those laws. It's the law of monophyly that you can never evolve out of your ancestry. So that once you are a mammal, for example, then it doesn't matter if you eventually, if, if someone is born with no mammaries or no hair, you know, any of the other descriptive characteristics for what a mammal is. We don't say that that person's not a mammal anymore because it's based on your phylogeny. So if you were, if you were a human child, you have human parents and you don't have, you know, 10 fingers or two arms or two legs or, or the, you know, the size brain that, that humans are generally described as having, we don't say you're not a human anymore. You are still a human, even if you're different, right? So you can, you can be as different as you want to be. And even if you eventually become a a sustained clade that your parents were not you still belong to all of your own ancestral clades that they did so you've just added a new node to that that maybe your parents didn't belong to or, and when i say parents of course i'm i'm drawing too fine a line because uh, evolution is not individuals out of you know a, a single family evolution right. is of course a population level things like the evolution of languages there was not like there was never a first guy to speak french who then had to get wandering around latin speakers to you know looking for somebody to speak french with <laughs> that, that's a that's a good analogy so okay so, so just just to give people a little bit deeper understanding of clades let's talk about all the different clades that humans belong to not all of them but what are what are the main clades that humans belong to well, you know how, how Linnaeus had those seven categories. Uh, in my series, I show that uh, the, the, the seven was a mild underestimation. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yes, I, I use them as signposts so that we, we will still make reference to the family of hominoidea, for example, that you know the, the family of, of apes that we belong to, and that great apes are the subfamily. Uh, yeah. And we'll make reference to, uh, you know, what, what is it? The class of mammals? I, I forget because they're not they're not really important in the cladistic concept. Yeah, but, it, it, and this is something that's a little bit confusing. And I actually see people screw this up in scientific papers sometimes. Is that we're we're actually at a point in classifying animals where we mix the old version with the new version, and there's confusion pretty frequently about that. I don't know how the <laughs> scientific field can get past that, but there is a mixing of the old and new that's confusing. And, and when people try to, to cling to that old Linnaean construct, you know, when you have an infra order, you know, or an infra class, you're just, you're just trying to wedge too much stuff in there. And, and that, that, that construct was never, was never going to be capable of doing this. So right. we have, uh, we, we, we talk about five named clades because there's a lot of clades that are not named, you know, they'll, they'll draw on a cladogram that we can tell that, you know, these organisms, I have these different synapomorphies in common and so that they should be bound in a parent clade but it's not the same parent clade as this other one which has which only has another parent clade below that and so the name of the clade isn't important so they'll, they'll very often draw the cladogram without any names on it and in fact well, there's quite a few in our cladogram that we have to literally make up names for just for the system to be able to, the system can't create something unnamed unless we name it unnamed. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll either put in that the clade is unnamed or we'll, we'll put in, you know, deuterostome three, you know, okay. we have an unnamed subset of something like that. As I said, occasionally we will mention, you know, mammal or the, you know, rarely the, the phylum or kingdom or anything, but when you get into the family and genus, there's some practical application there that people can cannot be so easily lost. So let's dance back in time through humans. So we've got, you know, we're Homo sapiens sapiens. So we that's that's our species. And then beyond that, where do the clades go as we expand back back further okay. in time? Uh, well, well, again, you know, you know, Linnaeus had had seven. And then when uh, when I first went to college, they would already realize that that was incorrect. That they had to add a, an eighth one for domains. But in my systematic classification of life series, I just uploaded the 26th episode and I still have at least a dozen more to go. And most of my episodes cover more than one clade at a time. So one of them, I think I cover a half a dozen clades all in one episode. So, I mean, that would be like Linnaeus's entire construct in the first two episodes. <laughs> so yeah. there's yeah. something like 40 uh, ultimately in the whole series. 
So uh, where we start from, I mean, uh, they, it all begins with eukaryotes. A lot of people would want to argue that, you know, since bacteria were here first, we must have evolved from bacteria. But we didn't evolve because evolution is, uh, is a, a ancestor descendant relationship. So it's, it's summarily defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. And that doesn't really apply when we're talking about horizontal gene transfer. When we're talking about microbes, very often, too often, we're talking about horizontal gene transfer because bacteria and some other microbes can just, they can exchange genetic material on contact by yeah. a number of different means. And so that creates a very muddy phylogenetic tree. So that when we are doing, uh, the, the easiest way to do this is that when you get into multicellular organisms, now you have an ancestor descendant relationship that is more easily defined. And then and the horizontal gene transfer can influence that, but it doesn't, it doesn't create any new branches uh, where, it, where it would in the other ones. So we, we say that the tree of life rises out of a web, or a, like a mesh network. Darwin, his first sketch was this little tree-like structure. And he said, I think this is how things were. And he was absolutely correct for multicellular organisms. But when we get down to microbes, a lot of evolution happens in a much stranger way. You really have to go down to the gene level to actually see evolution happening because at the cellular level, these things are just swapping genes with each other willy-nilly. And so you don't really have an evolutionary tree in bacteria. You have this, this kind of grid, the yeah, web. You have, it, you have evolution happening. I mean, there is mutations occurring within genetic lineages and their ancestors are affected by these and the you know, that would be evolution but it's muddied by the fact that there's also outside influences confusing that yeah yeah each 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 gene is evolving through descent with modification but they're being passed and swapped between different cells so you have exactly. and so weird... part, of the, part of the confusion with uh with the abiogenesis for example with the emergence of the first eukaryotic cells or the first living cells is that the cells we have today have organelles that have been maybe not created by evolution they could have been created by and an, uh, endosymbiotic uh, relationships with bacteria or by exchanging uh, different genetic components for weird constructs that not everything has in common i mean when we look at the complexity of the cell we think that this is absolutely uniform for all living cells, that all of the same machinery exists doing the same things the same way in every other cell, but, but that's not the case. There are other organisms for which the, the genetic construct and the mechanics are, are surprisingly different. Maybe the same most basic components, but they're structured differently or they behave differently or the mechanism is awry somehow. And they're still functional, they're just functional in a different way. All implies an evolutionary ancestry, or at least uh, in, at the, at the evolution mixed with the horizontal gene transfer. At no point do we get the intelligent designer thing ever makes sense <laughs> in any of our analyses. So you're saying if, if you go back, if you have humans, you go way far back in time, you find eukaryotes. So there's this, there's this clade called eukaryotes, right? And what does that mean? Okay, so a eukaryote is a larger cell than a prokaryote. The prokaryotes are bacteria and archaea, which archaea are not bacteria. They're, they're called archaea bacteria, but they're actually different. Uh, and they're more closely related genetically to us than bacteria is. So it wouldn't be fair to say that we evolved from bacteria because it's not, it's not exclusively evolution. It's not a, a, an ancestor descendant relationship, too much horizontal gene transfer. So what, when, once it becomes exclusively a relationship, an ancestor descendant relationship, so we can definitely call this evolution, by that point, it is in a eukaryote cell. And the eukaryote cells have the organelles, which sometimes aren't necessarily eukaryote cell organelles. I mean, they may be endosymbiotic uh, uh, enslavement of another bacteria, like mitochondria. Uh, it, everything except excavates, the most basic forms of eukaryotic life, has mitochondria in it. Some excavates do, some don't. So the, the idea is that in these earliest organisms, one of them uh, was infected by a rickettsia bacteria that was itself disabled somehow. The rickettsia didn't have the ability, once it got into the cell, it began to affect it, do its thing, and it was supposed to, it was supposed to vacate. It lost its escape mechanism and became mm -hmm. bound in the cell. And so that, uh, that the, the, the mitochondria replicates 
you know, more or less symbiotically with the with the cell, not necessarily always. And it has its own genome. It, and, and the genome is not human. The, the genome that, that the, the mitochondria has is bacterial. And then plants did the same thing. So they started out as eukaryotes, so they already have the mitochondria. But then they also got cyanobacteria. The reason that they can photosynthesize is not because they got that ability at all. It's because they, they enslaved the cyanobacteria to do it. So then moving on from, from uh, uh, eukaryotes, uh, a half a dozen clades up through, through a little uh, complexity there, we get into animal, which has a slightly different cell, cell structure than plants. We don't have the hard uh, cell membrane. And then I realize I'm going back to like middle school for most of yeah. them. <laughs> well, 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 let's rewind here because here's, here's where kind of the, I think the, the newish thing for a lot of people comes in because I didn't learn about clades when I was in high school. And so I assume that a lot of people haven't either. So in the eukaryote clade, we humans are eukaryotes but so are fungus, they are also eukaryotes, so are plants, they are eukaryotes. So when you go way back to the base, these, these really basic clades, pretty much everybody is included. And as you move upwards towards uh, modern humans, the clades get smaller and smaller and smaller. So we start with eukaryotes, and then you're saying we're moving up to animals. So now with animals, we're excluding plants, we're excluding fungus, we're excluding single-celled organisms. One of the things people don't realize is there's no such thing as a single-celled animal. Animals are, by definition, multicellular. <laughs> Except for an exception that we'll talk about later with uh, <laughs> cancers. So, but yes. Okay. So uh, if people want to say that, you know, I ain't no damned animal. But if you know what an animal is, an animal is any multicellular eukaryote that has an internal digestive tract. Mm. And every one of them does. And so there's one that has a slit in it that people want to argue that maybe that's not, uh, it, but it, it, it actually folds to make the, the tract internal. So yeah, even the, even though it's a slit and you could, if you had hands small enough, you could peel it apart. It still has an internal digestive tract. So the, the definition holds. And so people, this is the definition of what an animal is and it applies to everything. And so with every category, with every one of these clades, you can say, okay, well, I'm a nephrozoan. You know, what is a nephrozoan? A nephrozoan is an animal that has a through gut, you know, you have a mouth at one end and an anus at the other. You know, that, that internal digestive tract is connected at both ends instead of just one. Because there's a lot where there's a lot of organisms like jellyfish, for example, where the mouth and the anus are the same thing. Yeah. How lovely a thought is that? <laughs> <laughs> And, and then uh, uh, then there's others like uh, deuterostome is a fun one for me because it's it's where you where the in in the development of the cell for the animal cell it's you have a the the, just, the digestive tract opens from one end and goes to the other now in most animals it opens from the mouth first and opens all the way through to the anus but in deuterostomes which sadly includes us uh, so deuter deuterostomes is a clade. Yes, right. it's a clade. Okay. And so the, the, their, our development as deuterostomes begins anus first. <laughs> and then it finally erupts on the other end into the mouth. So there was, there's literally a point. And this is the first thing that develops. So you have this little blastopore, and the first opening begins. It's not even a digestive tract yet. The very first thing it is, there's literally a point where all you are is just an asshole. <laughs> yep. Makes sense, right? It's, one of my, it's my favorite biological joke because <laughs> it's real. We're, we're just fighting against our nature all the time. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So so you've got eukaryotes, then deuterostome or then animals, then deuterostomes. So we're getting more and more specific. We're we're getting more and more towards yeah, humans. And skipping here. bits, of course, you know, because there's there's yeah. quite a few in between. Yeah. Let's say let's, let's talk about like two or three more, and then then I. Okay, I, well, I, you, let's uh, yeah. we we can uh, we can get into vertebrates. For, well, actually, vertebrates is quite a well. Let's just go let's skip to vertebrates. Yeah, vertebrates is a really good thing to talk about because vertebrates, the first vertebrates, of course, were fish, and. So if, if we're talking about the clade, the vertebrate clade, we're talking about all fish, we're talking about all reptiles, all amphibians, all mammals. Well, no, we got to talk about fish for a moment because people are going to say, <laughs> exactly. if the law is that you can't evolve out of your ancestry, then how is it that we're not fish anymore? But, the, but there's a, there are two words that no longer have a taxonomic meaning or they had to change the taxonomic meaning. One of them is fish. There's no, <laughs> there's no hard and fast definition for fish. Because uh, first of all, it's not just vertebrates. I mean, there's some argument over this, but you know, the earliest the earliest fish were chordates, even before they were vertebrates. 
you know, and again, then we have to argue about what is exactly a fish. And then if, if it's going to be that fish are cold blooded, because almost universally they're considered to be cold blooded, but now we have warm blooded fish that we've just recently discovered. Right. right? And, right. and we have, there are fish that are, that are universally accepted as fish. Everybody understands these are fish, but they walk around on four legs. And I'm not even talking about, you know, tetrapods. I'm talking about angler fish that right, literally right. walk around on four legs. So there's, and uh, there's fish, I think, that even don't even have gills. So there, there's, what the hell is a fish? A, a fish is a colloquial idea. So mm -hmm. either it is that there's no such thing as a fish because we don't have a definition that's hard and fast and consistent, or uh, we're all fish. And there's another one, reptile. This word had to change too, because people want to imagine that uh, at some point in our ancestry, we were reptiles by this colloquial definition where a reptile is a cold blooded scaly thing with claws. But there are reptiles that are again, universally accepted as reptiles that don't have scales, that don't have claws, you know, that don't meet all these criteria. So there had to be something else. So now that reptiles have been redefined so that they're diapsids uh, or seropsids, but you know, generally we say diapsids. So diapsids included reptiles and our ancestors were never diapsids. So our ancestors like Demetrodons were synapsids and they might've looked like reptiles in the eyes of somebody like Richard Owen, but we don't see them as reptiles now. Just because they're cold blooded, scaly and claws doesn't mean they are reptiles. Likewise, amphibians, we were never amphibians either because amphibians is another clade that branched off after that and led to frogs and salamanders and so forth. We have right. things that we would classify as amphibious. You know, it, it works like kind of like the word carnivore, because there are there are sharks are obviously carnivorous, but they're not carnivores because carnivore is a clade that is exclusive only to one subset of mammals. When you say that there is no such thing as a fish or no such thing as a reptile anymore, what what you're saying is that in cladistics, which is now the dominant classification yeah. system in cladistics we don't have a fish clade uh we don't have a a reptile clade because the clade needs to include all of those organisms plus all of their descendants exactly. and because People because mammals to... mammals if you go back far enough in time we evolved from fish so if you were to have a fish clade mammals would be in it yeah so they used to have this classification that i mentioned before where you know, apes were in the genus Pongo and humans are in this different genus. So we couldn't have evolved from apes. But then when it was realized, and this was only like 30 years ago, that our ancestors, you know, the Australopiths and so forth would definitely have been classified as apes. So we actually do come from apes. Well, then the same thing goes on when you go to the next step further, because it was popularly, uh, popularly envisioned that all of the old world monkeys were in this sister group called Circopithecoidea. But then they discovered Proplyopithecoidea, you know, Aegyptopithecus and Proconsul and, and things like this that 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 you know that qualify as old world monkeys. Nobody's gonna argue this. So now the word monkey applies the same way that the word ape does. And people get really weird about being called monkeys. But the thing is, is if you define all primates by, uh, by their, their classification, that you know the, the traits that all primates must have in order to be classified as primates. You describe people. And when you describe the subset characteristics of the haplorines, the dry nose primates, well, we are dry, dry nose primates. And you get to the next one, which is the simiforms or anthropoidea. Either word for that clade means essentially monkeys because that's all it is. It's old world monkeys and it's new world monkeys. And how could you have old world monkeys and new world monkeys and have a common ancestor that wasn't a monkey itself? Obviously, if we're gonna be monophyletic, then the, our ancestor ended up being a monkey. And there are some paleoprimatologists who now agree with this and say, and we're talking about the leading ones now, you know, Flegel and Delson, they were saying way back in the day that yeah, our ancestors were definitely monkeys. So we actually did come from monkeys and truthfully really are still monkeys right now because there's no classification for, for the, you know, the, 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 people will point to the size of the ribs or for the shapes of the teeth, there's no consistency for all of them that distinguishes them from us. If you describe all the characteristics that identify what a monkey is, if you have all of the, the ones that all monkeys share in common, you describe people. 
And then if you go to the old world monkeys and do those those characteristics, you describe people again. And then if you go to the next subset for hominoidia, which is the family of apes, you're describing people again. And then the subset great apes, you describe all their characteristics, you describe us again. And one of the characteristics, for example, for apes, and for great apes at least, is a, a dramatic reduction in the number of hair follicles. So that chimpanzees and gorillas have the same number of hair follicles as we do. And there's a general reduction in the fur. And there's a reduction in other things too. So that when people say, well, they're hairy and we're not, we're, not, no, we're just as hairy as they are, believe it or not. <laughs> the big change that has happened from Owen to Darwin, or well, I guess it was ha started happening after Darwin, th this move to cladistics where we start naming and classifying things by their evolutionary history. Owen had this idea of archetypes. And so a fish kind of makes sense within his, his system because there is kind of an archetype, you know, a general thing that's fishy like, and that's, that has its own usefulness. And it actually still has its own usefulness today, kind of, you know, in, in layman's terms, right? I think we mentioned in a prior conversation, when you go to a restaurant to order fish, yeah, you know, you, you're not expecting that, that, uh, you know, beef or pork, are gonna, or chicken are going to be on those menu items, even though they're all technically fish in one right. cladistic sense. We have a right. colloquial understanding, and that colloquial understanding would not include a whole lot of others. When we order fish, we're expecting only that we're going to get one subset of teleosts. We're not going to get lungfish. We're not going to get shark. Right. You know, we, and, and this is why <laughs> there is so much confusion between, like, when when you have a lay person talking to a cladistic person sometimes people can talk over each other and there's confusion because we have, we're actually using the same words in a lot of cases, but we're using them in different ways, which for me, I, I care a lot about language. That's actually kind of frustrating. I wish that we would invent new words for all this stuff now that we have a new classification system, but I'm not the, uh, it, it is <laughs> difficult for some people to realize that we are not, we were never reptiles, but we are, we are uh, just really weird monkey fish. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've outlined the main difference between the old classification systems and the modern classification systems. We've talked about what a clade is. We've talked about some of the confusions that, that come up. I want to talk about the, the big, the really weird thing in cladistics in that we now have examples of single-celled mammals and uh, single-celled, yeah, single-celled marsupials. There is this cancer that formed in Tasmanian devils. And if you get cancer, one of your cells has evolved. It's rebelled against your body, essentially. It's, its genes have changed, and it's trying to survive and reproduce inside your body as if it's its own organism now. And it will start to reproduce, and it and its, its babies will take over. And, you know, usually a cancer kills its host by just being a really crappy citizen, right? So it'd be like uh, it's it's like a human colony that well, eats all the animals. Well, our of the earth is a good example of that. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> if we continue to consume the way that we are, I mean, we are essentially a cancer right now on our ecosystems. But so so you've got a you've got a cell that rebels. It starts evolving, and it's your immune system is trying to attack it. It will its ancestors will evolve ways to avoid the immune system. There's this battle that goes on, and if you lose you die and your cancer usually dies with you. But this cancer in a Tasmanian devil, we don't know exactly when it happened, but it somehow evolved the ability to spread to other Tasmanian devils. So when a, when a Tasmanian devil bites another Tasmanian devil, usually in the face, this tumor will transfer from one devil to another. And it actually does that through a fairly sophisticated uh, mechanism where it tricks the immune system into saying that, no, I'm part of you. It don't attack me. And at first we thought that maybe this was only possible because Tasmanian devils are so genetically identical to one another. But we've actually found now that, no, this, this tumor actually has developed a mechanism to shut off the immune system of its new host. And so we have what is essentially a single celled organism that evolved from a mammal. And so according to cladistics, this is a single celled mammal. How should we deal with this? <laughs> that, I, I'm, I'm glad that that's, well, no, I, I, that kind of is up to me to, to, to say if I'm going to be working on this project. I'm going to be 
Uh, I'm just going to turn that over to the scientific community to work out that one. <laughs> this is one yeah. of the, there's actually many examples of where nature doesn't fit into our, our simplistic, our, our, our weans of, you know, look at, look at the laws of nature that we come up with. You know, people want to say that these are laws that are decreed by a God, but really this is just a human trying to summarize in the simplest terms possible, what we can confirm to be true. And mm -hmm. so, if you don't phrase it correctly, or if you don't work out your formula right, you know the, that law could actually be wrong. You know, it's like right. Newton's law right. of gravity was actually wrong. Yeah, there's there's not going to be an uh, there's not going to be an absolute consistency, probably because it this wasn't an intelligent design. Clearly, evolution is such a messy process that no matter what classification system we come up with, there's going to be weird exceptions. There's going to be just things that drive us crazy. And this is uh, an extraordinary weird exception, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, but the fact that we found one, we've actually found some, a similar thing happening in dogs. They have an STD that's actually a cancer, a communicable cancer. And then there's one in hamsters, there's one in clams, and there's actually been a few cases in humans, but in humans it's always been you, you need your immune system to be, you need to have like HIV or something that's messing up your immune system to get these cancers. So it's... <laughs> We actually don't know how many single-celled organisms out there actually evolved from multi-celled organisms. There could be more than than uh, we're currently suspecting. But one of the things that I that I want to point out about the new cladistic approach to classifying organisms that's that's different. Well, we do have these issues, these problems that come up. But the thing that's so beautiful about it is that there actually are right answers and wrong answers when we're trying to figure out what evolved from what. And that means that this is a system that scientists will be able to perfect and modify for, you know, years to come until it's nearly perfect. And that's not something that we've had before in our classification systems. We haven't been able to actually say, oh, this is right and this is wrong, but we can do that now. Yeah, and that, that what it used to be is something like the way we would classify vegetables. It's any plant that we eat that's not a fruit. And that's, right. <laughs> that's not a useful means of classifying anything. And, there, and as you said, there's no way of confirming it. But now that we have the genome, we can actually back up whether we are correct or, or where we need to make a change. Right, right. So not a perfect system. But it is you... objectively verifiable, which right. gives it value. So let's just, um, can I have you right now explain to the audience what the what people will be able to do on the website, kind of what it's going to look like once it's up. Okay. The the video series that I'm doing right now, The Systematic Classification of Life, does show, uh, it has screenshots of the, 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 the website as it looks now, or the database as it looks now. And this is, uh, there's no illustrations that you can see. It's just a bunch of maybe confusing Latin, Latin words if you're, you know, if you're not already fluent in this, uh, in this study. So it, it's easy for people to get lost in it. And that's why I made the video series is kind of, you know, again, signposts to guide people along. This is what you're looking for. This is the next thing to click on, that sort of thing, so that other people will be able to navigate it. As, as we improve it, there's ways of prettying this up, and, and we're on the phase two of that right now. Uh, one of our admins came up with an idea for how we can make this look a little bit more attractive to other that, people who are not scientists but who are in, interested in the subject. And then every clade uh, has a more info box. And ideally, every clade will have illustrations or encyclopedic depictions and citations and so forth included in that. Of course, when we're talking about tens of thousands already entered and, and heading to a goal of millions, most of those boxes are going to remain empty for quite some time. But, you know, many of them are going to have some degree of information in there uh, right to start with. And so it, what we're hoping to do when we unveil this in, uh, in fall uh, of 2018 is what we're shooting for. We, we, we actually meant to do this two years ago and then last <laughs> year. And then, but yeah, and, but so now the date's been pushed back to the fall of this year, September, October, something like that. It, uh, it always takes longer than it does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when people can finally access it, we want to make sure that 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 we have the the server capacity for for people to use this on a large scale, or to at least review it on a large scale. 
it's going to be it's going to be not as pretty as some other cladograms that you can access right now. I mean, there's one like called one zoom, I think that, that is, is just lovely to look at, but it doesn't teach you anything. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no academic value to it. And that, that, that's really what we're looking for. There are, I think three or four other cladograms that are, Ooh, that's pretty. And they are, yeah. but they don't have, they don't, they, they don't have the practical application that this one does. So our purpose in this is to have a peer reviewed, tool that the scientific community is actually using right and so, updating yeah. and updating and they're eventually that we're just going to pass it over just hand it over to to control it but we want to make sure that it's it's in a secure safe position so that nobody's going to screw it up yeah. so we've, we've paid an awful lot for the the uh the securities that have been built into it for example and then that 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 makes it a little bit. It's difficult to enter data into it because of the you know, the strength of the securities that are already there, you know, with with demons mar marching around the system every two minutes or so and keeping the backup copy of everything and then keeping things on separate servers and all of this. So that when you get the, the website to look at it, you're you're not even looking at the actual thing. That's somewhere else, and that's backed up somewhere else. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, so because there had to be some, um, there had to be, a, had to be a lot, an awful lot of the substrate that had to be worked out before we could start entering any species at all. So I'm impressed that we've we've done as much volume as we have already, and there is some value just in looking up the names if you know what the names mean. And there is a search feature, so that you can go directly to, if you know the Latin name, or ideally if you know the colloquial name, for any particular animal. I mean, you'll be able to find that. Uh, yeah. Somebody somebody challenged me the other day. They they asked for two things, a spider monkey and a uh, and a raven. And I was embarrassed to see that when I looked up, neither one of those things were there. So I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't oh, oh you, you, tens okay. of thousands of other the things. Name. Yeah. <laughs> and these two things are not there. So <laughs> yeah, that, so we we had a meeting about that. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I I am really really excited for this project to go live. Uh, we'll have to have a. <laughs> A party on my channel when you when you finally make it live. Okay, just to be able to go through and explore that, uh, I'll probably get addicted to that for a while. Um, I'm really impressed with your work. You being able to pull this together and you know work with such a diverse group and get researchers involved so that everything can be uh, fact checked and you know peer reviewed. This, this is that, that's this is been amazing. Crazy. Just putting it together for that for that reason alone, it's been crazy. Because every every video that I do in that series, I'll have to go and look at the screenshots that I'm going to look at. I have to look at them and verify that these things are where they're supposed to be because they haven't always been. And I'll find discrepancies that you know you, you'd expect even if you're working with professional scientists. But I mean, let's be realistic. I'm working with with volunteers, and I'm surprised that the volunteers have actually done as well as professional scientists have on in most instances so that's been really right. impressive but there's some things that have exposed even errors on the scientist's behalf and so I'll, I'll, I'll i've found a couple places where the scientists have screwed up and not always accidentally <laughs> well i there's there there's legitimate debate in science as to as to what animals go where i got one for you there was a scientist who fudged the figures for religious reasons he wanted to believe in a designer and he couldn't, and he's a, this guy's a well-respected authority, but he wanted to believe that there was an intelligent designer and he didn't like the fact that some of these things were classified in, in clades that no longer exist. And so he insisted on classifying them in clades that do exist so that they all seemed to be intended. And so he mm -hmm. fudged, it was inexcusable. And he yeah. was the only person to have done any research on this particular organism. So I had to notify a whole bunch of other people, say, hey, can we, can we, we need to look at this. And somebody, somebody do the peer review on this because he's, he's done the only study on this limited, not well-known thing. And everything he said about it is fraudulent. So this yeah. Can be fixed. I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't talk about the details of this. I'm not going to talk about the details of this, but there... I've seen the same thing happen for conservation reasons because there are laws about, you know, which species are protected and which are not. And I've actually seen people fudge data to, to fit that, <laughs> which is, uh, I agree with them in one way and that it's important to keep these animals conserved, but I do not agree with them 
screwing up with the data to, to make that happen. But there are ideological reasons that people screw with the data. And when there's so much, so many organisms and this, this stuff is happening at such a fast rate, then a lot of times things don't get double checked. Uh, even in, you know, peer reviewed journals, it's not deeply peer reviewed. So I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be corrections and things that continue to happen, which is great that you guys have figured out a way to make it easy to correct things in your system. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. Just so everybody knows, there are links in the video description that are going to show you Aaron's videos that he's already done on phylogeny. And when the Phylogenetic Explorer project is open to the public, when the website is actually live and you can actually go explore the tree of life for yourselves, I will have a link uh, to that in the video description as well. Well, thank you. But, Just remember, this is, this is going to be a work in progress that will never be complete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's too many, too many organisms. And they're changing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It will be over when the internet fails to exist. <laughs> right. yeah, I like that. I, I saw a commercial where the guy says uh, he's finished reading the internet. The internet gives him a little thing. You've even you been to every website. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he saw some crazy stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Aaron. Great having this conversation. This was actually our second time doing this. The first time my recording failed. And it's funny because at the beginning of that, you said you're trying a new recording program. And I said, do you have a backup? Yep. That was unprofessional of me. So this time we're using YouTube's tools and um, hopefully that's solid. So, all right. Well, it was a pleasure. And, I, and of course, uh, I, I uh, offered to be on your show because uh, I respect your channel. Oh, well, thank you. So, yeah. yeah, it'd be great to do something again in the future, especially once you have this uh, project up and running. Some of you have probably noticed that Aaron is, he, he talks a lot about creationism. He is in, where are you located? You're in Texas. I'm in Texas, yes. Yeah. I am the Southwest Regional Director of American Atheists. Yeah, so so the creationist stuff pings you all the time. It's, it's constantly a, a topic. Yeah. <laughs> at the, so it was a pleasure. I look forward to talking to you again in the future when the project's up and running. So long. Thank you much.